All right, we're going to watch the video segments here. I'm going to be pausing these videos as we go through them. We're going to be making some comments and um, just incredible some of the stuff that you're about to see. And uh, I apologize for some of it. Some of it's going to be a little bit graphic, you know, but stuff needs to be brought out. So let's watch this. This is going to be the report on the Baptist preacher, uh, Joe Combs, you know, professor at Hiles Anderson College and what they did with their daughter. So let's watch this. We go back now to the Bible Belt and the story of a child kept as a servant in her own family. For years, her father, a Baptist minister, had managed to keep secret what was going on, but suspicions had begun to surface. And then, without warning, the girl vanished. Sylvia Chase picks up the story. Faith is fundamental to the people who live in these hills and border towns along the Tennessee and Virginia line. There ought to be something that you care about, that you want God to do. When word began to circulate that Pastor Joe Combs might be in trouble with the law, he took his quarrel with the police to the airwaves. I'm scared. Uh, my family's scared. We have seen so many crooked things done since last February. We have no reason to believe that justice will be done. The conflict between the pastor and the detective escalated. And with Esther nowhere in sight, Detective Richmond had Combs ordered to court. Mr. Combs testified under oath that she had ran away and he had no idea where she was at. I didn't leave home. I was sent away. Joe sent me away because the police kept coming around. Indeed, Esther hadn't run away. She was sent, first to Charleston, South Carolina, to a fellow preacher's house, and then on to Watkinsville, Georgia, and the home of Susan and Roger Combs, Joe's brother. Experiencing normal family life for the first time, Esther felt confident enough to confide in her Aunt Susan. Out tumbled the long-held secrets of her tortured life. Many, many, many nights, um, uh, Esther and I would sit up. Basically, she would be crying, you know, and... Uh... But it must have made you very angry. Oh, yeah. Esther was safe here, but still threatened by phone calls from Joe and Evangeline Combs, who said Esther was making it all up. We said, she said that? And I said, yes. And uh, I said, we believe her. He said, it's not true. You know, none of that happened. And now you knew your brother was lying to you. Oh, yeah. He knew it. I knew it. I know it. She had been gone for six months, beyond the reach of the family that had hurt her so deeply. We love you. Yes, we do. Hoping that the detective back in Bristol still cared, Esther made a bid for survival. She called for help. Out of the blue, she called me on the telephone from Georgia, and she said, I want to tell you everything that has happened to me from the time I was a baby. Wow. And I laid the phone down, and I screamed, <laughs> because I knew that I could help her then. Detective Richmond immediately drove to Georgia, and in this home, in this room, began to hear the story of Esther's life, of her ordeal in the fellowship hall, home to the combs where no one outside the family had been permitted. As we walked, Detective Richmond revealed that not only had Esther been brutally beaten, she had told the detective she was sexually abused as well, often in the men's bathroom. A lot of the beatings occurred in here where she would be made to stand in a circle. She said uh, one would beat her until that one got tired and then the other one would start beating her. She was beat with ropes, chains, whips, umbrellas, bats, hammers. Joe and Evangeline Combs were arrested in November of 1998 and Esther was there. Debbie let me come because I wanted I wanted to see I wanted them to see me 
you know, Debbie hadn't done it, I had done it. I'm the one that told. And what happened? Did you speak to them? She come walking over to me and telling me how much she loved me and that I was her baby girl. I think it's the first time that she had said I love you that many times. What did you say? Every time she kept telling me that she loved me, I just kept telling her I didn't want her love. As much as I did, I'd always wanted it. I just kept telling her I didn't want it. But even at that moment? I wanted it. Joseph and Evangeline Combs pled not guilty to charges unthinkable in this small town. Child abuse, kidnapping, rape. And their other children rose to their defense. Brothers Jimmy and David Combs and sister Cindy also denied any involvement in Esther's alleged abuse. So if your brothers and sisters say that they never saw you beaten, then they're lying. But the trial was approaching, and it would be Esther's word against the rest of her family, not the strongest of cases against a powerful preacher in a town of true believers. Prosecutors worried. Then an almost miraculous discovery in a curbside trash can. And now the dramatic conclusion to Sylvia Chase's story. Reverend Joe Combs and his wife Evangeline are about to go on trial charged with child abuse, kidnapping and rape. And despite everything Esther has been through, prosecutors are not sure they can get a conviction. The case would have come down to Esther's word against the rest of her family had it not been for a totally unexpected break. By chance, a former cellmate of Evangeline Combs found critical evidence, recognizing the family in photos discarded in this curbside trash can, turning them into police. Photographs supporting Esther's story, her hands bandaged after being burned, her eye blackened, her chin bruised, her other eye bruised and cut, all as she had said. And when Joseph and Evangeline Combs walked into court, people who had known them finally began to talk. Did he ever tell you what Esther Combs' purpose was in life? Did Mr. Combs tell you that? He said that God had created her to be a servant and they were training her to serve. Dozens of people had been interviewed by Detective Richmond, who believes they were afraid to challenge the preacher. Now, they testified about the nagging concerns they'd had for Esther. But no evidence spoke louder than the scars. 410 wounds, scars upon scars. She grabbed my skin with the pliers, pulled, tw twisted it and pulled it out until it took a, a She grabbed my off. teeth and shoved them back up in my mouth. And when I looked up, he just cracked the stick over my head and it started bleeding and I fell to the floor. Esther sat trembling through the questioning, at times shielding her eyes from the gaze of her parents. There was little attempt to rebut her testimony. Did you or did you not give her a black eye? Never. For a few brief hours, Joseph Combs took the stand in his own defense. He denied all of Esther's accusations. I, I, I'm bewildered by all of this. I can't, I can't get my mind around it. It doesn't make any sense. Evangeline Combs did not testify. The defense team relied heavily on the testimony of the other Combs children. But in the end, it took the jury three hours to reach their verdicts. You find the defendant, Joseph D. Combs, guilty of intentional or annoying aggravated assault. Joe Combs was found guilty of assault, aggravated abuse, rape, and kidnapping. Evangeline Combs was guilty of multiple aggravated abuse charges. Wearing their prison stripes from the Sullivan County Jail, Joseph and Evangeline Combs came to court for sentencing. Joseph Combs was sentenced to a total of 106 years and was immediately led from the court. As Evangeline Combs awaited her sentencing, Esther Combs asked for the chance to speak directly to her parents one last time. I just wish you could tell me what I did to make you hate me because I loved you so much, even though you put me through hell, because I told myself you did it because you loved me. Evangeline Combs would only stare back, emotionless, 
as Esther spoke. She would soon be sentenced to 65 years in prison. I would have done anything for you. I would have moved mountains if I thought it would make you love me. That's how much I loved you. That's how much you hurt me. After the trial, Esther made a fresh start. Towels and sheets, blankets. Moving into a new apartment last month. How are you? And there are good people around. A boyfriend, Joe Sawyers, who is sharing her new life. There's the joy of a new job and a weekly paycheck from Walmart, where Esther works as a cashier. <laughs> You're fine. And at 23, Esther is learning how to drive. Joe is a patient teacher. So you need lettuce. Yeah. Detective Debbie Richmond says that Esther will always be like a daughter to her. They visit at least once a week. Well, I've got to go to work. See you. Bye. Love you. She saved my life. She means the world to me. I can never repay her for what she did. It's up to Esther now, who struggles daily with lingering pain and sorrow, and a persistent fear of her father, and longing for the love her mother denied her. The memories are still so fresh. I mean, I smell a certain perfume, and I swear up and down she's behind me. The damage is deep, but one day at a time, Esther is surviving, nurturing her tenuous hold on life. A life almost shattered in the name of family and in the name of faith. When we first told you Esther's story last November, people reached out to her, sending clothes and furniture. A local dealership even gave her a car. And now, as you just saw, she has to learn how to drive. All right. Well, that's it for that one. And uh, just, you know so disturbing and and again understand that this joe combs guy was abusing his daughter this way and him and his wife were doing this while he was teaching students the bible at hiles anderson college nice next we're going to go to um uh, let's see what else do i have here trying to think of uh, we'll watch I guess uh, the Linda Murphy video okay now this is going to be the video of Jack Hiles's own daughter Okay, now you can't get much closer than that to who Jack Hiles was. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna watch this and we're gonna hear her personal testimony and gonna see about this. So on with the show. Mm -hmm. Our first speaker tonight is uh, Linda Murphy, and she's a popular inspirational speaker an expert in human behavior as a certified personal and professional development coach, a practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming, and student of interpersonal dynamics for over 25 years. She has been educating, speaking, and mentoring people on how to reach their dreams, thrive in the midst of change, and fulfill their highest destiny, both personal and professional. A seasoned sales and business development expert, business owner, speaker, and inner success coach, Linda offers a vast breadth of experience and expertise. She has served as a consultant to many individuals and corporations, and she has been instructing and fashioning executive management, sales professionals, and entrepreneurs to realize their goals and dreams. But perhaps Linda's greatest achievement is as an empowered survivor. As you will hear in her deeply moving story tonight, from cult to courage, please welcome 
the lovely and very courageous Linda Murphy. Early in my life, I learned that there was one thing that could kill a festive mood at a dinner party, and that was to talk about me. <laughs> to talk about my life, my life as the daughter of a cult leader. There was very little that was jovial or lighthearted about the first 28 years of my life. So I avoided that topic at all costs. It was too painful, nobody could understand. So I became a master at diverting attention, at diverting the conversation onto somebody else, but not me. I so rarely talked about my life that on the rare occasion when I would slip and somebody would kind of push for me to divulge, I couldn't just casually and comfortably share it. I would vomit the story. And it would go something like this. Well, I grew up outside of Chicago, and my dad pastored actually a wonderful church there that through the years evolved into a 50,000 member cult. It operated and still <coughs> operates under the guise of an independent fundamental Baptist church. But those who have left, the followers who have tried to leave, the outsiders, even the media, who was on 2020 last year, recognize that it's clearly a cult. Every member was in complete obedience to my father. They didn't dare disagree or be disloyal for fear of being publicly ridiculed or punished or banished for doing so. They didn't go on a vacation without asking my dad's permission. And if he had said to drink the Kool-Aid, I'm not kidding, they would have. My dad lived a double life, one of a righteous family man and dynamic speaker in the public eye but one of sordid sexual secrets privately. Secrets that only my siblings and me and my mom knew. He hated my mom, hated her, treated her terribly, abused her, and even turned his own children against our mother. We hated her. He told us she was crazy. We thought to make him happy, we'd hate her too. Our home was filled full of turmoil, hatred, stress, strife. And as a little girl, it was isolating, it was intense, and it was frightening. He had affairs, <laughs> he had a mistress for many years, the wife of a Sunday school teacher, built her family a beautiful home right around the corner from our house. You could see their family from our back door. It was, it was craziness, living one way, preaching another. My brother, my older brother, he became another version of my father. He took a, he pastored a church in Texas, was found to have been having affairs with 14 different women, um, divorced that current wife, married one of the 14, my father tried desperately to cover it up, moved him to another church where he was found to have had 17 <laughs> affairs with different women. And he just recreated what he had seen my dad live. And my dad did nothing but cover it up. I felt like I had one main responsibility as a child. <laughs> it was simple, but daunting. And that was to keep all the secrets. And there were so many. You see, he had taught us that the best way to please God was to please him, because he was God's man. 
and he taught us that to please him, we had to keep all the secrets. We could never even tell our best friends what went on in our home because we might be the cause of this, the destruction of his ministry. I literally feared for my very life if I ever talked about my dad's ministry or about what went on in our home for fear that it would hurt his ministry. I was so afraid. And the greater the secrets, the greater the fear and the greater my determination to keep quiet. I gotta tell you, the money part of it was pretty nice. As a kid, I mean, think about it. Tithes and offerings from 50,000 people? Hello? <laughs> it created a lavish lifestyle for our family. My father owned most of the city <laughs> where the church was. He owned a college, two high schools, two grade schools, a cemetery, blocks of buildings. He was very wealthy. And even into our adult years, he owned us. He owned our homes, our cars, our furniture. He owned our lives. And we didn't dare cross him because we were too afraid we'd lose everything. He died a multimillionaire. He left nothing to his children. He left everything to the organization, which my younger sister and her husband now lead. And they still perpetuate his legacy, the strict rules, the undying loyalty, and they still try to keep all the secrets. I never understood why was I the only one of the four kids so tortured by the hypocrisy, so disturbed by the mind control over thousands and thousands of people, and so determined to find a better life. Why was I the only one that insisted on answers to my questions? And why was I the only one that ultimately broke away and cut ties with the brainwashing, the oppression, the fear, the secrets, and the life that had never been my life? I finally walked away when I was about 28 years of age then being estranged from my entire family. And I did not see my family again until many years later at my dad's funeral. Okay, see what I mean? Not a story to share at a dinner party. I really got to the point after I left there that I couldn't talk about me. For one thing, who would understand? For another thing, it was too hard. It hurt too bad. So I made a mental note in permanent marker that said, must never talk about my life. And for many years, I didn't. I couldn't. However, wonderful things have happened through the years since I left there. <clears throat> therapy, <laughs> a lot of therapy, deprogramming, freedom from the mind control, and I began to heal and learn and accept and forgive and even learn to be thankful for that bizarre life that I had because I realized I was learning some amazing lessons from not only being there but from having the guts to leave. And I now have values that are deeply carved in my very soul from that experience. Values you don't get from reading a book or from a workshop or another person. Values that are only this deeply ingrained 
when you live what I lived. Because my dad was a cult leader, I now embrace three values, and no one will ever take these away from me. The first one is freedom. Freedom to explore my own interests. Freedom to live within my own value system. Freedom to determine my own value system. You stop it right there for a minute. She just said, freedom to determine my own value system. Freedom to determine my own value system. Why does that sound familiar to me? If you know your Bible, you know where I'm going with this. This is one of the main reasons I did this whole study. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch, touch, it, touch it, lest ye die. See, the rules imposed, these nasty rules. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. You'll get freedom, like she just said. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Freedom to make up your own beliefs, your own moral code. You see, that's what Jack Hiles is all about. He did it to his own daughter. And what he did there is, he basically forced all rules, and he put in some rules from Scripture, the thing the Bible says a woman is to dress in modest apparel, but you force it on women that are not saved and they don't understand why am I dressing in modest apparel here? What is the point of this? Well, because we told you to. That's not the standard. Okay, It is a willing, submissive thing that you do as a woman before the Lord. You say, I want to dress the way you tell me to dress, Lord. Not because you're forced to do it to be saved or to stay saved or whatever else. That isn't it. You are willingly doing that thing as a as a part of sanctification as a Christian lady, you know? But see, when you when you put it down on, on people, when you put it down on women, and you put all these other standards out there, some biblical, some not, and you force it on people that aren't saved, guess what happens? You can actually flip them to becoming, you start out as a professing Christian, and you flip them to becoming an atheist. And notice she said, she said that I have three things now that no one is ever going to take from me. And she's like an atheist now. Why? Because Jack Hiles was a minister of Satan. A man that created a system whereby he could flip people, tell them that they're saved, knowing that within a few years of forced standards and all this other stuff, they'll flip right around and be hardened atheists. Let's continue watching. Freedom to believe what I believe and never stifle what I believe. Freedom to disagree. Freedom to ask questions and require honest answers. Freedom to ask questions and require honest answers. Um, yea, hath God said? Interesting. Let's continue. Freedom to learn who I am and freedom to love who I am. The second value was truth. I learned pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be very free until I dealt with what was true. And that was hard for me. Truth was a scary word for me because, I mean, my entire life, I had never been allowed to speak of what went on in our home. I had never told even my best friends what went on in our house. Being truthful was one of the scariest things I could think of. You see again how the devil did this thing? She's, I'm, I'm afraid of, of you know, telling the truth and things like this. But the Bible says Jesus Christ is the truth. 
John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But see, you do so much evil, and you control people's minds like Jack Hiles was doing, and you get them to cover up truth, not biblical truth, but the truth of the hypocrisy of the system, and they come out and they say, oh, we weren't allowed to speak the truth there. You see the satanic nature of this whole system? Let's continue. I learned that secrets grow in the dark, but when exposed to the light of truth, they start to lose their power. Mary Vernon, my dear, amazing therapist in Dallas, Texas, who nurtured me and who loved me through years and years of healing. She used to say to me, Linda, you're only as sick as your secrets. You are only as sick as your secrets. So I stopped keeping secrets. And as scared as I was in my late 20s, I finally began to deal with what was true. I fa finally began to speak what was true. And I eventually learned how to live openly, only in truth. And the third value is courage. Did you know that you actually can't have freedom or truth if you have no courage? Courage is a requirement for both. You may desire to live in complete freedom and complete truth, but if you're lacking in courage, you will live in neither one. In my late 20s, I had a tiny shred of courage. Not much, but it was all I needed. Because my desire to live and be free and honest was so great that that teeny shred of courage that I had was enough to allow me to walk away. I have a plaque on my desk that I have had for years, and it's gone with me everywhere I've ever moved. It says, the secret to happiness is freedom, and the secret to freedom is courage. And that resonated with me. I knew I wasn't going to be happy unless I was free. But I knew I wasn't going to be free unless I could muster up some courage to get out of there. Pause it again here. You know, she wasn't going to be happy until she could be free. Free from what? See, free from the cult that her father was running, but she associates that with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Just like a lot of the people that are former members of the First Baptist Church or Hiles Anderson College. I had to get free from there. Well, let me just say, if you're a, a former member or you know a former member of the First Baptist Church or Hiles Anderson College, let me just say, you've never experienced freedom, true saving faith that comes through, through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never experienced it. If, you filed, uh, if you've followed Jack Hiles and his perverted teachings, you've never experienced true saving faith because Jack Hiles doesn't preach it. I had to cling to and act upon that tiny shred of courage in order to finally leave a cult, the only friends I'd ever known, my childhood connections, my history, my family, knowing that in doing so, I would finally have what I had longed for my entire life, and that was freedom, truth. Freedom, truth, courage. Three words that may be kind of trite and overused to some people. To me, they are the air that I breathe. 
values upon which I insist on living and loving in my life. Oh, and one other thing I actually now value, sharing my story, talking about me. <laughs> Who would have thought? I now recognize that it's in sharing my story that I can so passionately share with you my values. Values gained from 28 years of an emotional prison that kept my heart under lock and key and kept my mind from knowing what, what I knew. You know, I sometimes wonder if perhaps living in the absence of our values <clears throat> is what can most clearly determine what indeed our values are. And for me, I really believe that the absence of and the denial of created the presence of. For so many years, I was denied freedom, truth, and courage. And now, I will never let them go. Not to worry. You're still not going to find me at a dinner party talking about my childhood. <laughs> Not going to happen. You won't find me sitting around elaborating over my father who took a wonderful church and turned it into a 50,000 member cult. I still know that's a mood killer. I get it. But you will find me here and in other appropriate settings, especially if I can help somebody talking about my life with sincere gratitude for all that I've learned in spite of and because of living in the absence of freedom, truth, and courage. And thank God I now have, I now am, all three. Thank you. So there you have it. And if you go to her website, uh, uh, and Murphy here, let me see if I can find the website. I'll show you this on the screen here. It says, Linda Murphy, aspiring to live in freedom, act with courage and speak my truth. And her book is called Healing from a God Who Wasn't. My, journey, my journey from religious fear an entrapment to freedom and truth. A guide for victims of toxic faith searching for religion rehab. Okay. And a lot of these other members of the former Hiles cult are also doing the same thing. Then you say, well, Brian, I think that they're still saved. They just, you know, are in some kind of remission or something. Well, I believe in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, which says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay, True salvation is going to get you to a place where you're never going to turn on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're never going to say, I am now an atheist or something like that. You might sin, you might mess around and do some stupid things as a Christian, but you're never going to come out and just say, I'm finally glad I'm delivered from all that. It was all a lie and everything else. But a lot of Jack Hiles' members do exactly that. But now she talked about this thing of, um, you know, the adultery that her father was involved in. And basically, back when Jack Hiles was still alive, there was a program done on a current affair on this whole thing of Jack Hiles' current affair. So let's watch this video now. The church deacon says his pastor stole his wife. He lusted after her. He says the pastor controlled his life for years, forcing him to sleep in his basement. The pastor denies it. He has harsh words for the retired deacon. A fellow who would allow an outsider to send him to the basement would be a wimp. Thy deacon's wife. Hello everyone, I'm Ari Povich. Welcome to A Current Affair. The First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana is a multi-million dollar operation. 
the Hammond, Indiana church boasts of having the largest congregation in the country. One thing they're not proud of, however, is the battle between their pastor and one of the parishioners. Our John Johnston tells us the pastor is accused of having an affair with the church member's wife and keeping the same man locked away in the basement, praying for an end to all the sins he saw around him. The man who used to live here says his American dream turned into a 12-year nightmare. Victor Nishik, a one-time faithful follower of the First Baptist Church in Indiana, claims his pastor banished him to the basement so the pastor could make whoopee with his wife. He drew close to me to keep an eye on me and to work on me, to accept this arrangement. He worked, you know, she was, he lusted after her, mind, body, or soul, or whatever, before he drew close to me. A fellow who would allow an outsider to send him to the basement would be a wimp. Pastor Jack Hiles not only calls Victor Nishik a wimp, but a womanizer. I never one time made any suggestion concerning his living conditions. All of that was because his wife was going to divorce him because he'd asked his secretary to run off with him. On another case, occasion, his wife found him in a bedroom around midnight with a beautiful girl in his bedroom and Mr. Nischik had his pajamas on. It's a fabrication. There's no truth to it. If I, if I had somebody to run off, I would have run off with that somebody. I would have been glad there would have been a way to escape. After 12 years of being banished to the basement, Victor Nishik went to the Reverend Jack Hiles and told him, I can't take it anymore. He says Hiles was good enough to build him his own separate bedroom there up over the garage, but still kept him apart from his family. Nishik claims Hiles My not only controlled his whatever. wife, but every aspect of their lives. It was down to the minute and the hour when I would come and go and when she would come and go, and it all worked into our responsibilities at the church so that people would not question why these two were never together. Mrs. Nistrick is a member of my staff and has been for over 25 years, a faithful, loyal member of our staff. I am her pastor, her employer, and her friend, and that's all. Nothing more. Nothing more. Is there or has there been? Mrs. Nistrick is one of the most proper women you'll ever meet in your life, and it's tragic for an innocent woman to be scandalized by a womanizer. Jeannie Nishik would not meet with us, but did sign these letters for Pastor Hiles, supporting what he said. My accusation is of tampering with my home from stealing my wife's affection and total, complete mind control. And I was controlling our lives to the nth degree. This was the extent of my accusation. But I will not go insofar as sexual because I never caught him in bed together. Despite saying that, Nisha claims Hiles offered to swap wives. He said, if you want her for the same relationship I had with Jenny, you have my permission. And I told him that he had, you know, I told him that he was sick. He was a sick person. I could not tell you how I felt when he dared to say that my wife would even consider such a thing. My wife is a clean, moral lady in the strictest sense of the word. And Mr. Nischik was just telling a bold-faced prevarication and lie when he said that. Hiles has been pastor at the First Baptist Church for almost 30 years. He claims to have a congregation nationwide of more than 65,000. The church itself looks like a corporation, fully equipped with a department store-sized parking lot. About 7,000 of Hiles' followers pack his church here in Hammond, Indiana, faithfully every Sunday. Victor Nishik calls the congregation a cult. It's another allegation that Hiles flatly denies. Many of us see symptoms of a Jimmy Jones situation being repeated. And I'm not kidding you. Realistically. Realistically. He has stated publicly, if he called and said, staff, drive up on the uh, Skyway Bridge and jump into the river, they would all do it. I've given my life here for 30 years. They love me. I love them. But I'm not God. And this is not a cult. And I'm not a cult leader. I'm a pastor of a New Testament Baptist church that loves his people and wants to help them. But Pause it there for a minute. You know, first of all, it's the old lie again. I'm a pastor of a New Testament you know, Baptist church. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, no you're not. Uh, New Testament churches are not run like Hiles was running his system here. But, uh, you know, just the hypocrisy of this whole thing is just incredible. But let's, let's finish here. Nishik is convinced he was brainwashed into being a believer for 14 years. Do you look back on this now and feel foolish at all? No, I don't feel like a fool at all. In fact, I feel very strongly that I did the right thing. Because leaving, and this, this I, I believe very strongly now, is leaving would have tossed my children into a meat grinder. There are some who would probably watch this story and say, how could you allow this to go on for so long? I was totally committed to the ministry. I would not dare compromise it. I have men in this church now that tell me that they would willingly give up their wives for this ministry if, if it meant, you know, to propagate and to make it more successful. I felt I was doing God a favor. I've had one woman in my life, John, one woman in my life that's the mother of my children. And after 62 years of working for integrity and character, to have a shadow cast over it, it hurts just like it hurts you. We can add one fact in this story. Victor Nishik and his wife Jeannie are now divorced. They live separately. So there you have that video. But one thing you can get definitely from that is somebody's lying. Now either it's Victor Nishik or it's Jack Hiles. You say, well, Brian, it, it looked to me like Jack Hiles is telling the truth. Well, let's think about that for a minute. If you're a pastor, the one-man pastor system is wrong, but let's just go with it for a minute. If you're a pastor, you have a New Testament local Baptist church and all this stuff, and you know that there's a guy there that is immoral and having problems and things like Jack Hiles said that Vic, Victor Nishik was doing, why would you keep him on your staff? Why would you keep him around? Hmm? He said, well, his wife, you know, Jenny Nishik was a really good woman. She was a good woman, a godly woman. Like Jack Hiles said, uh, it doesn't matter. If her husband's no good, you say, out. Sorry, you can't be in ministry here. Why would Jack Hiles have kept him around? That's a problem, isn't it? But you see, again, this thing of mind control. You know, Vic Nishik is like, you know, I was under mind control. I was, it was, you know, they were controlling me. You know, he was controlling me. And that's what I've been saying for a long time. The carnival preaching, the, the way a lot of these guys preach, they are very loud, they're very charismatic, and they get you involved, and they, and they, they control you. You read about that in the book of Acts, about the guy that, that bewitched the people there, you know, and with his speeches and things like this. You can, you can control people by using special modulated speech. Hitler did it. Okay, now we're going to go to, next we're going to look at the uh, Jack Hiles, uh, Hiles Anderson College promotional video. All right, this is the one where he talks about being the father, you know. And again, now watch, watch the way that he modulates his voice and the way that he talks in a storybook narration kind of way. Watch this one. Hi, I'm Jack Hiles, and I'm the founder and chancellor of Hiles Anderson College. I'm standing looking at our campus, and I'm describing in my own mind what Hiles Anderson College is all about. Hiles Anderson College, I often say, is not a college. It's an army. Okay, let me pause it there. It's not a college, it's an army. Was that true? Yeah. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. Because you see, if you know anything about this ministry, you know one of the things that I will expose a lot is I will expose the Jesuit order. Now the Jesuits are a Roman Catholic order that was created way back in the 16th century, right at the, the heat of the whole Protestant Reformation time period. The Jesuits were created to bring everyone back under the authority of the Vatican. 
Now, what would be a really good way to do that? Well, I infiltrating independent fundamental Baptist circles and by preaching false salvation. And it's interesting because you have all this, all these sex problems in the Catholic churches, and yet they're going on in Jack Kyle's cult like crazy as well. I mean, we read some of the testimonies and things and list of sex offenders and stuff like this. Hiles Anderson graduates. Doing all kinds of things, torturing their children and things like this. The head of the Bible department torturing his daughter. 410 scars he put on her body. The Catholics torturing people. Hmm. Could it be that Jack Hiles was a Jesuit? You say, well, Brian, do you have proof, you know? Well, no, I don't. I am just simply throwing it out there as a possibility. I can't prove it. No, I can't prove it. No. I don't have a piece of paper that says Jack Hiles joined the Jesuit order in such and such year and went to Georgetown University and whatever else. I can't prove that because they wouldn't let that kind of a thing come out. But you look and see what do the Jesuits, what is their plan? What is their goal? Jack Hiles was following it. His system is not helping Bible-believing Christians, it's helping the Vatican. And we're going to see a little bit later that there, are, there is a reference to the Jesuit order made in a video that their cult put out. Very interesting. We're going to see about this coming up. But let's continue with what Jack Hiles says here. It's an army, you know, it's his students there, their army. Our students are not students, they're soldiers. Our faculty is not a faculty, they're sergeants and trainers. Training an army to reach America with the gospel of Christ and to save our country. Okay. Training an army with the gospel of Christ. Interesting, he doesn't identify which, identify which Christ he's talking about. But uh, to, to save America. Uh, chapter and verse. Where in the Bible does it say that America, the great Western superpower, is going to be saved in the end times? There's no mention of America in the end times. No mention of a Western superpower. You know why? Because America is going to be destroyed. And if you want my honest opinion, I think it's going to happen after the rapture. I think the Lord's just going to pull, withdraw His hand of protection from this country when the body of Christ leaves. Because there's a lot of Christians here, a lot of good ministries here and things. Hiles' cult was never one of them. But there's... A lot of good things going on here. I think the Lord's just going to pull back and just let America just fall, to, fall apart. But again, this great preacher, Jack Hiles, and he's saying we need to save America. And yet he can't claim to be pre-tribulation, pre-millennial you know, millennial and all that. Sure. Let's continue. That isn't all. Hiles Anderson College is not only an army, it's a family. I'm not the chancellor, I'm the father. The students are not the students. They're my children. Okay. Now the Bible says, let me get you the reference here. You know, this thing of, of him coming out and saying, you know, I'm not the chancellor, I'm the father. You know, they're my children. I know what some of the brethren are going to say. Let me look up the reference here. I don't have it written down. Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Okay, you're not supposed to have the title father. Okay, a religious title of father. You know, and you say, what well, doesn't Paul say about, you know, um, Onesimus? I do know where this one's at. Book of Philemon. Uh, Philemon chapter 1 verse 10 says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. You say, well, see right there, Paul is saying, my son Onesimus. So who was Paul? He was Onesimus' spiritual father. Well, now that's true. He was. Spiritually, it was like he had begotten him. Okay? You lead somebody to the Lord, it's like spiritually you're, they're now one of your children. Okay? 
That's, there's no problem there. But should Paul have taken the title of father? Should Onesimus have said, oh, Father Paul, forgive me, Father Paul, for I've sent you? Know? No, of course not. What's being condemned in Matthew 23, verse 9, is a religious title. Call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father which is in heaven. Right? It doesn't mean that you can't say to your dad, hey, father, he's my father or whatever else, because the Bible says, honor thy father and mother. See, again, that's not a religious title. It's a description of one of your parents, the male aspect of your parent, you know. <laughs> All right, so Matthew 23, verse 9 is talking about a the spiritual title there, that you are not to call somebody a spiritual title of father. So you say, well, Brian, Jack Hiles wasn't doing that. He wasn't doing that at all. You know, he's just referring to what Onesimus, you know, Paul was saying with Onesimus. Really? So then all of the students there at Hiles Anderson, they're all saved by uh, Jack Hiles? See, logically deduce this stuff, folks. Look at this thing for what it is. Jack Hiles cannot hold the title Father because Matthew 23, verse 9 forbids it. He cannot hold the spiritual title of saying, I've begotten these you know, children in, in my bonds or things like what Paul did here in Philemon chapter 1, verse 10. He can't do that. Why? Because Jack Hiles didn't, most certainly did not lead all those kids to the Lord, you know, the, the college students and things like that. So why would he say, they're my children? I'm their father. They're my children. Kind of weird. Let's continue. The faculty don't, does not work for me. We work together. We're a family. Howells Anderson College is a, an army. It's a family. That isn't all. Howells Anderson College is a church. These are not just my students. They're my members. I'm not just their chancellor. I'm their preacher. And this college is owned and operated by the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. We invite you to come and see us. And if God leads, become a part of us. Join our army with which we can save America. Join our family and be one of my kids. Join our church. Be one of our members. We welcome you to Howells Anderson College. Well, I'm going to go sign up, man. I'm just uh, so convinced here, you know. Sure. <laughs>